four? Anybody? Oh, wow, we had two at four. Who just didn't go to bed, right? No? Huh? 230. God bless you for being here today. We got a lot of coffee out there if you want some. Oh, wow, so this is second church for you. Well, this is just my first church. So. Well, hey, Merry Christmas, everybody. It is a low-key kind of Christmas morning. I don't know if you gathered. Uh, but I think it's kind of fun uh, just to, in this kind of atmosphere, remember the Christmas story. Uh, and I didn't anticipate a lot of kids being here. I do have candy in case there were kids that wanted to come up and sit and read the story. Come on up, man. You can sit on the step. You can eat the chocolate, right? It'll just be you and me having some bro time. Um, but I just thought this morning, uh, to kick things off as part of our message, I would read a wonderful little book to us called The Christmas Promise. And so you can all sit up on the stage and view the pictures, or we do have them up on the screen if you'd rather look up there. Uh, but it's a simple story. It's probably familiar. Uh, and it may seem a little silly to read a kid's book right now, but at the same time, there's kind of something about that that invites us to let our guard down and maybe listen to a deeper message. So let's just check out The Christmas Promise for a second. A wonderful book. Starts off, A long, long time ago, so long that it's hard to imagine, God promised a new king. He wasn't any ordinary king, like the ones we've seen on TV or in books. He would be different. He would be a new king, a rescuing king, a forever king. And do you know what? One precious night, God kept his Christmas promise. Would you like to know how he did it? Well, the Christmas story starts with an angel. Whoosh! And when I read that to preschoolers, that's where they go, ah, and they laugh and they giggle. <laughs> we do. We go read at MELC every other week. It's Monmouth Road Learning Center. Those kids love these books. It's great. But he came from God to see Mary, and the angel had a special message. Mary, you're going to have a baby. He will be a special baby. God promises that your baby is going to be king, not for a little time, but forever and ever. He will be the forever king. Well, Mary was going to marry Joseph, so God sent another angel. Whoosh! Ah! He came to see Joseph, and the angel had a special message. Mary is going to have a very special baby, the angel said to Joseph. Her baby is going to be king, and he will rescue his people. He will be a rescuing king. And God had promised that his new king would be born in a little city called Bethlehem. And that's where Mary and Joseph went. But Bethlehem was very busy with lots and lots and lots of people. So when the baby was born, he had to sleep in a manger instead of a bed. All the other mangers in Bethlehem held food for hungry animals to munch. But this manger held a tiny baby. He was God's special new king. And the shepherds in the fields had such a surprise. It was quiet and dark, and the sheep were snoozing. When whoosh! Thank you for playing along. <laughs> An angel popped into the sky. Now the sky was bright, and the shepherds were so, so scared. But the angel had a special message for them. Don't be afraid. I have wonderful good news for you, the angel said. God's chosen king has been born tonight. He is going to rescue his people just as God promised. He will be the rescuing king. Then lots and lots of other excited angels joined in to celebrate. The shepherds were really excited. They went rushing to see the new king, and there he was lying in a manger, just as the angel said. But they weren't the only ones who had heard the good news about the promised new king. Some wise men living far, far away had also been sent a message. It was quiet and dark, and they were watching the stars when, let's say it together, whoosh, <laughs> a new star popped into the sky. The star had a special message. 
The wise men knew what it meant. A very special king had been born, the king for all God's people. This child was the promised new king. The wise men were so excited, and so they went on a long journey to see the new king. And there he was, just as the star had shown them. Everything God promised came true. There are lots and lots of different kings in the world. But God sent the greatest king of all. He sent a new king, a rescuing king, a forever king. And do you know what this king's name is? We can say it together if you like. His name is Jesus. It's a wonderful story. It's a familiar story. And it may seem maybe a little odd to read a children's book together as a bunch of adults. However, I think this story is special and that it kind of clues into maybe the main theme of Advent that's so easy for us to overlook. There's a lot of different elements to this story and a lot of different parts that draw our attention. Uh, The virgin conception, that's a a great story. That's a a highlight for a lot of people. Uh, There's the shepherds, that's a highlight for a lot of people. There's the wise men, we talked about them a little bit last night. There's a lot of different elements to this. But when we focus on just one part of the story, it kind of detracts from the overall message that's being told to us here that I think this story does a great job of really zeroing in on. At the heart of it, Advent, Christmas, is about the birth of a king. And each of these individual elements, they tell that message in their own right when we look at them and and what's going on and what the text actually says. Uh, For instance, in the book of Luke, when we talk about the virgin conception, chapter 1, the angel says, He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. The virgin conception at the heart is a message about the birth of a king. The shepherds in the field, if we were to look at Luke 2, you really have to look at the whole story there. It's loaded with images and verbal cues that are these comparisons between Jesus and the fake king, Caesar Augustus. It's a very political charged story, but we kind of miss that sometimes. If we were to look at the wise men a little closer, Matthew chapter 2, verse 2, and they asked, where's the one who has been born king of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose, we've come to worship him. Each element of the Christmas story is telling the same message. It's so easy for us to overlook sometimes. Christmas is wonderful. It is a time for charity. It is a time for compassion. It's a time of fulfilled promises. It's the birth of a Savior. But even more prominent in the story than any of those, Jesus is being born and he is king. That's a wonderful, wonderful message to grab a hold of this morning. A king has been born. And by the way, he's not a king in metaphor. The Israelites were not waiting on a metaphorical king, nor were they waiting on a king-like leader. Uh, the, The shepherds, the angels, they weren't told to go worship a religious figure that had been born. They were told to go worship a king. When we hear about Herod, Herod heard the message from the wise men, who also were looking for a king, that a king had been born, and it greatly disturbed him. Not because Herod was threatened by religious ideology or by metaphorical leaders. He was threatened by a a legitimate political opponent, a king. That's why he flew off the deep end. Everyone in the Christmas story recognizes what's happening in that moment, and it's important that you and I today recognize that as well. Christmas is first and foremost the story of a king coming into this world. And it's difficult for us at times maybe to appreciate the full weight of what that means because we in our our government and our society, we're not used to kings. Like we get the concept of a king, but we don't have experiential knowledge of living under a king. Or we don't have appreciation for the magnanimous occasion of a king being born. Probably the closest that we could come is if you were to think back nine years ago, which I know is like yesterday to all of us, right? 
But if you were to think back nine years ago, there was a little prince born in England, Prince uh, George, I think his name was. Yeah, see, I don't even care that much because he's not my king. But <laughs> Prince George was born to Prince William and Kate Middleton. That was a huge deal over there. Like the whole family was on the cover of magazines and London Bridge lit up in a special display for this little baby and British people are raising you know, the Union Jack everywhere. It was, it was a big deal for them. And that's probably the closest we could come to really appreciating what it means for a king to be born in this world. This is a huge, huge thing that's happening here on Christmas night. But there weren't bridges that were lit up for Jesus, and there weren't flags being waved through the air. There were just shepherds and a manger, which maybe isn't the typical kind of pomp associated with the birth of a regent. But that's okay. It doesn't make him less of a king. It just means he's a different kind of king, which is really a prominent theme throughout the entirety of the Christmas story and the Gospels as a whole. Jesus is a king. He's just a little different. And he came, just like every king, to reign over a legitimate and literal kingdom. It may not have been a, a geopolitical kingdom. It may not have been a, a, a city-state or a nation-state, but it was a kingdom that he came to reign over. And everybody in the Christmas story and in the, the Gospels recognizes this as well. That's why immediately after the birth narrative, if we were to look at the story in Matthew, we find John the Baptist. And do you know what the first words out of John the Baptist's mouth are? Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. Matthew didn't put that word there on accident. We saw the birth of a king, now we see the birth of a kingdom. If we were to go to the book of Luke, it's a little different, or I'm sorry, the book of Mark, rather, it's a little different. It's not John saying this, it's Jesus himself in Mark chapter 1, verse 15. First words out of Jesus' mouth. The time has come, the kingdom of heaven is near. That's a proclamation that there is a kingdom being born here. If we were to look at Luke, it's a little different. After the birth narratives, we have these two people, uh, one named Simeon, one is a prophetess named Anna. Both of them see the baby Jesus. They celebrate his birth because it means, quote, the salvation and the redemption of Israel. And when you and I hear those words, we may be tempted to think of those in religious terms primarily, and they are. But in first century Israel, those were just as much terms of politics and power, salvation and redemption of a nation. Everyone in this story understands there's a king being born. And he has come to reign over a kingdom. Again, not a kingdom in metaphor, not a kingdom in idea, but a kingdom, even if it is a little different. And our story this morning reminds us that as a different kind of king, reigning over a different kind of kingdom, he also comes to initiate things in a, a different kind of way, with a different kind of revolution. And that's maybe the wildest part of the Christmas story of all, it is the beginning of a revolution. I mean, Herod loses his cool because there's a new king in town. John the Baptist is out uh, disobeying, the, the, not disobeying, but opposing religious leaders and zealots and people in high positions of power because there's a new kingdom involved. Jesus is bringing about a change, a revolution, and people seem to recognize this. That's why people entrenched in power were very threatened by him. The religious leaders, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, Herod, Herod's son a little later, even Pilate to some extent, all wanted him dead, not because of his religious philosophies, but because of how he was opposing people in power and shaking things up. He was starting a revolution, but it wasn't a revolution of, of power or a revolution of, of violence. It was this really weird revolution of compassion and mercy and graciousness and acceptance and love, not to sound too much like hippies or anything, but it was a crazy revolution taking place. And the poor and the oppressed and the powerless and the downtrodden were coming in waves to follow after this new king and belong to his new kingdom. And when you start putting all of these pieces together, what you see happening is Christmas as the beginning of this crazy, wild story in which God was changing everything. A new king was in town. A new kingdom was invading the earth. A new revolution was underway. And God would not be content to let things continue on business as usual. Which brings us to today. And kind of back to our story that we read this morning. 
It's so important that we remember Christmas for what it is. And it is a lot of things. It is a time of joy. It is a time of, of gift giving and celebration. It's a time of togetherness and peace on earth, goodwill towards men. But first and foremost, it is the birth of a king. It is the beginning chapter of this wild new thing God is doing. A thing that is changing you and me and history itself. It's this new movement in which he will not be content to let things continue on, business as usual, because there's a new king in town. And as our story reminds, he's a very special kind of king. He's a new king. He's new in that he's not like any king we've known before. He doesn't continue on doing things the same old way that we've become accustomed to, but rather in the way that our hearts long to see accomplished, to truly lead people and shepherd people and save people the way a king should. That's why he's also called a rescuing king. He didn't come to take or to procure power or accumulate wealth. He came to give and to sacrifice so that he could save his people. And he is a forever king, which maybe is the thing we need to hear the most sometimes. Because the world is always changing and shifting, sometimes for good, sometimes for ill. But even when the tides turn against us and the world seems like it's spinning out of control, we have a king who sits on a throne, who is not threatened, who is not deposed. Even his own execution couldn't defeat him. No, he sits at the ready, and he waits for the day when he rides out, and his invasion of this earth is fulfilled, and he claims all of his people and all of his creation for himself once again. Christmas is a wild story, guys. And it's not because of virgin conceptions or angels or shepherds or wise men. It's because it is the opening chapter of this grand epic of God's conquest. It's the beginning where a new king sets foot in this world. And he says, this earth and all of these people they are mine. And I'm taking them back. Even though it cost me everything. Or should I say whoosh, right? It's a beautiful story. And it's our story. And I don't want to overshadow Christmas, but a new year is coming. And in light of that, I would encourage you to think, if I'm a part of this story that is changing everything, how is it changing me? And in this coming year, how will I live differently? Because God is not content with business as usual. He's got a plan for you. A beautiful plan. We're going to talk about it more next week. There's the tease. Come back. But in the meantime, I would highly encourage you to consider, how will I follow my king in this coming year? Let's pray. <clears throat> Father, thank you for today. And thank you for the birth of this Savior and this King. May we sing his praises. We don't have flags to wave or bridges to light up. But most of us have voices to lift up. 
And so let us sing his praises today for all we are worth. Singing to all he is worth, which is so, so much. It's in Jesus' name we pray these things. Happy birthday. Amen. Amen.